The Mandalorian Season 3. Episode 3 delivers the show's longest episode to date, presenting the opportunity for a variety of Star Wars Easter eggs. The Mandalorian Season 3. Episode 3 provides a plethora of references, hidden details, and broader Star Wars Easter eggs. With The Mandalorian Season 3. Episode 3 serving as the show's longest to date, the increase in runtime, which clocked in at 59 minutes including credits, allowed for various Easter eggs to be presented. It was an unusual episode, taking viewers across the galaxy from Mandalore to Coruscant, and allowing audiences a chance to see how the Star Wars galaxy has changed since the days of the Empire. The episode, entitled Chapter 19, The Convert, largely followed Omid Abtahi's Dr. Pershing an Imperial scientist captured in The Mandalorian Season 2. Pershing was manipulated by Aaliyah Kane, with tragic results. Meanwhile, on the Outer Rim, Din Djarin and bo Katan Kryze dealt with the consequences of their redemption. These two plots gave The Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 3 a strangely disjointed feel, but it was one that really helped develop the galaxy and allowed for a massive number of Star Wars Easter eggs. 24. The Mandalorian Season 3 Episode 3 hints at Gragu's first words. The Mandalorian Season 3. Episode 3's first Easter egg comes early on, as Gragu burbles something unintelligible, but it's clear what he is trying to say. Pedro Pascal's Din Djarin and Caddy Sackhoff's Bo Katan cries trade the traditional Mandalorian line. This is the way, and Gragu babbles in response. It's clearly meant to be an attempt to emulate the Creed, which could well become Gragu's first words in The Mandalorian Season 3. 23. Bo Katan and Din Djarin are attacked by TIE interceptors in The Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 3. Shortly after the aforementioned scene, Bo Katan and Din are interrupted by the appearance of TIE interceptors. First seen in Return of the Jedi, the TIE interceptor is indeed much more dangerous than a regular TIE fighter. They don't possess hyperdrive units, so it's intriguing to wonder which capital ship dropped them off. 22. TIE Bombers are a callback to the Night of a Thousand Tears. While Din and Bo Katan fight off the TIE Interceptors, a squadron of TIE Bombers target the Kryze Castle on Kalevala. The bombers fly overhead and rain bombs down on the castle, decimating Bo Katan's home. While this scene is a way of making Bo's character more sympathetic and inducting her into Death Watch later, the scene is reminiscent of what has been shown of the Great Purge of Mandalore thus far, in which Thai bombers committed a similar attack on Mandalore's major cities. 21. The Imperials still have a major presence in the galaxy in The Mandalorian Season 3. Bo Katan rightly notes the fleet is far more than should be available to a simple Imperial warlord. The Imperial resurgence seen in The Mandalorian Seasons 1 and 2 is clearly continuing. Ahsoka Tano seemed to believe all the Imperial groups were associated with Grand Admiral Thrawn, a major leader who served under Palpatine. Season 3 is clearly continuing its Thrawn build-up. 20. Din Djarin messes up a superhero landing. There's a rather amusing superhero reference when Din Djarin rushes to his Naboo N1 starfighter. He jumps out of Bo-Katan's ship, using his jetpack to slow his descent, and attempting what Deadpool famously called a superhero landing. He messes it up, however. 19. The Mandalorian Season 3 Returns to Coruscant The Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 3 Returns to Coruscant Ander recently focused on Coruscant during the Imperial Era, and The Mandalorian returns to the planet decades later. There are some familiar locations, including the Opera House from Star Wars, Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith the Skydome Botanical Gardens, the Galactic Museum, and the Holographic Museum of Extinct Animals are all lifted from Kevin J. Anderson's Jedi Academy trilogy in Star Wars Legends. 18. Dr. Penn Pershing continues his Mandalorian story, revealing details of the Emperor's cloning plans. The Coruscant subplot focuses on a former Imperial cloner, Dr. Pershing, who pursued Gragu in the first two seasons. He gives a speech discussing cloning, revealing he was an expert in integrating different genetic strands to create new organisms, so-called strandcasts, such as Supreme Leader Snoke. His words, in which he recalls how his experiments were abused by someone with evil intent, foreshadow Palpatine's return. Dr. Pershing also name-drops the Kaminoans, confirming their technology was responsible for many of his breakthroughs. 17. Coruscant's rich residents are rarely impacted by the galaxy's politics. Coruscant's wealthy residents don't care much for galactic politics. One resident talks to Pershing and reveals he was almost drafted under the Empire. Empire, Rebels, New Republic, I can't keep track, he responds. To the wealthy, the great tides of galactic change are meaningless. 16. The Mantabog of Malastare references a Star Wars RPG book. 
The Mandalorian Season 2 has already introduced a new Star Wars creature called an Alamite, but Episode 3 references a classic creature from Legends. Pershing's droid driver references the Mantabog of Malastare, a creature introduced in the Legends sourcebook Coruscant, and the core worlds. These were airborne, blanket-shaped predators. 15. The New Republic has an amnesty program for former Imperials. The Mandalorian Season 3. Episode 3 reveals the New Republic run an amnesty program for former Imperials. This was set up in Alexander Freed's Alphabet Squadron trilogy, which focused on another former Imperial seeking rehabilitation. The program features reintegration institutes established across the galaxy, where Imperials are trained to work in the New Republic. 14. Gideon's communications officer, Aaliyah Kane, returns to the Mandalorian. Moff Gideon, villain of the Mandalorian seasons 1 and 2, is name-dropped, but one of his former colleagues appears. Katie O'Brien played a comms officer aboard Moff Gideon's flagship in the Mandalorian season 2, and her character, now named Aaliyah Kane, has found her way into the New Republic's amnesty program. At first, Kane seems to show remorse for her actions under the still-missing Moff Gideon, but she soon reveals her true agenda is far more sinister. 13. The New Republic is repeating some of the Old Republic's mistakes. One of the most subtle Star Wars Easter eggs in The Mandalorian Season 3. Episode 3 is a subtle reference that indicates the New Republic is repeating mistakes made by their predecessors. When Dr. Pershing introduces himself to his fellow former Imperials, they all go by designations rather than names. They are being dehumanized, just as the clones were dehumanized, given numbers not names. 12. Coruscant status is an ecumenopolis. Dr. Pershing listens to a briefing about Coruscant in The Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 3, and it feels almost like a quote from Wikipedia. Coruscant is defined as an ecumenopolis, the technical name for a city planet in science fiction. It's quite amusing to hear this designation formally used in Star Wars. 11. The Mandalorian Season 3 Seconds Ben Jude and Tong's Day. The Mandalorian Season 3. Episode 3 names two different days of the week in Star Wars and Universe Calendar, Ben Jude and Tong's Day. The Bendu are the canon precursors of the Jedi. Star Wars Rebels also featured a mysterious creature called Bendu who may be tied to this ancient order. The Tong come from Star Wars Legends, the humanoid race who ultimately traveled to the planet Mandalore and became the first Mandalorians. 10. Coruscant's carnival music is John Williams' March of the Resistance. The musical cue from The Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 3 is a neat Easter egg to the Star Wars sequel trilogy. When Pershing and Kane are shown attending a carnival somewhere on Coruscant, an upbeat version of John Williams' March of the Resistance can be heard. This track was composed for Star Wars, The Force Awakens and was used as the theme of the Resistance throughout the sequel trilogy. 9. The Coruscant Accords reference Chuck Wendig's Aftermath trilogy. The Mandalorian Season 3. Episode 3 features an Easter egg to Chuck Wendig's Aftermath book trilogy. This trilogy explored the time period between Return of the Jedi and Star Wars, The Force Awakens, and the transition from the Empire to the New Republic. It introduced the canon version of the Coruscant Accords, also known as the Galactic Concordance, the treaty between the Republic and the Empire. It seems they prohibit cloning, which makes sense given the last mass cloning involved the creation of an army. 8. The Rebel Alliance fleet is being decommissioned. Dr. Pershing is told the old Rebel Alliance fleet is being decommissioned, a neat reference to the Star Wars, The Force Awakens Visual Dictionary. This confirmed the New Republic passed the Military Disarmament Act, drastically reducing the size of its military to promote peace across the galaxy. It was later discussed in Claudia Gray's Bloodline, before becoming important in The Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 3. 7. Imperial Star Destroyers appear in The Mandalorian Season 3. The Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 3 showcases the disarmament of Imperial weaponry. Pershing and Kane sneak into the scrapyards of Coruscant onto an Imperial Star Destroyer. The iconic Star Wars Star Destroyer is abandoned, likely being stripped for parts by the New Republic before being destroyed. 6. The New Republic's Methods of Reversing Imperial Indoctrination Dr. Pershing is placed in a device he insists is similar to a Mind Flayer, technology previously mentioned in Season 1. He is assured it is less severe, and rather is a fairly pleasant device used to overcome Imperial indoctrination. It's quite disturbing to see the New Republic experimenting with people's minds like this, hinting the New Republic is not the utopia it likes to present itself as. The Mind Flayer scene features one of the funnier Easter eggs in The Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 3. 
The being running the procedure is a Mon Calamari, a well-established Star Wars race, with the most notable Mon Cal being Admiral Akbar from Return of the Jedi. Akbar is most famous for the line it's a trap, and the Mon Cal reacts to Pershing's plea that he too was led into a trap. 5. Admiral Akbar's It's a Trap is referenced in Mandalorian Season 3. The Mind Flayer scene features one of the funnier Easter eggs in the Mandarian Season 3, Episode 3. The being running the procedure is a Mon Calamari, a well-established Star Wars race, with the most notable Mon Cal being Admiral Akbar from Return of the Jedi. Akbar is most famous for the line It's a Trap, and the Mon Cal reacts to Pershing's plea that he too was led into a trap. 4. Alia Kane's theme music subtly foreshadows her betrayal. Another interesting musical Easter egg in The Mandalorian Season 3. Episode 3 comes with Alia Kane's scenes. Whenever Kane is on screen, specifically in the final sequence in which she tampers with Pershing's procedure, the musical score accompanying her is very Sith like. From the droning, unsettling synth sounds to the foreboding, dark way the score often rises and falls, Kane's betrayal is set up by her exceedingly dark side musical theme. 3. The convert title has multiple meanings. After The Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 1's title of The Apostate and Episode 2's title of The Minds of Mandalore, one would be forgiven for thinking the convert had an obvious, singularly focused meaning. However, the story of The Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 3 suggests the title has multiple meanings once again. Bo Katten joins the Death Watch, while Dr. Pershing converts from the Empire to the New Republic. Even Aaliyah Kane fits, because she feels like something of a double convert someone who pretends to have sided with the New Republic, but in reality is a lot more complicated. It will be interesting to see if future episodes have titles with similarly complex meanings. 2. Bo Katten is referenced as a Night Owl. The Mandalorian covert recognized Bo Katten's markings, identifying her as a Night Owl. Bo Katten's Night Owls were introduced in Star Wars, The Clone Wars, an elite, primarily female unit of warriors. They split after Darth Maul took control of Mandalore during the Clone Wars, with some following Maul and others remaining with Bo Katten. 1. Bo Katten joins Death Watch once again. The Mandalorian Season 3. Episode 3 ends with Bo Katten welcomed into the Children of the Watch. This is quite appropriate, given she was a member of the initial Death Watch group. It will be exciting to see how this develops over the course of The Mandalorian Season 3, and whether Bo Catton's loyalties change completely. Please comment your thought below and thanks for watching. See you in the next videos.